we have in Sunday school, we have been studying the book of John. And the book of John is a book that I really, truly love. Any opera time I have an opportunity to sit down and, and minister to people that, that are, are searching for God in their life or want to grow their relationship with Christ, I always lead them to the book of John. The book of John is, is a book that if you can read the book of John and you, don't, you get through the book of John and you don't know who Jesus is and what Jesus did for you, your heart hasn't been opened. Uh, it has not been opened. John is one of the pr most precious books I really truly believe for a new believer or someone searching uh, for Christ in their life. I believe the book of John is, is one of the best places to start. And, uh, and have thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed the book of John. Uh, we have been studying it in Sunday school. And uh, so I know that my time is coming to teach in Sunday school, so I kind of jumped ahead a little bit of where everybody else is at, because I know that my time is a coming, and, and I started in, in John chapter 12, and uh, we start seeing things begin to change in the book of John for the first ten chapters, we're hearing who Jesus is, and what Jesus did, and there are so many times in that scripture that Jesus says, my time has not come yet. My time has not come yet. And then when we find, get into John chapter 12, Jesus changes from my time has not come yet to my time is at hand. The time is drawing closer. And uh, as I had studied into John and looking forward, uh, this fair, I call it the farewell message of Jesus. Jesus preparing His disciples for Him not to be there anymore. Uh, and it has been an, an awesome, awesome study for me to look at. And so as we look at this morning in John chapter 13, verses 1 through 20, uh, it's about Jesus washing the disciples' feet. Now, I'm not going to teach you on us doing a foot washing here. I'm going, to, uh, I'm going in a whole different approach with that, but there are some things in this foot washing that I believe we can represent of what Jesus is trying to teach us here without actually taking, uh, doing the, the foot washing ceremony. I think Jesus is literally trying to teach us something right here uh, that's very, very important. Uh, in this scripture right here, I'm not going to read it again because Brother Chris has already read it for us this morning, but in this scripture in John chapter 1, I was very interesting to see that Jesus points out two disciples in this scripture. And the first disciple that he talked about was in chapter, uh, in verses 2, was where he talked about Judas, Iscariot, Simon's son. Judas is very known for being the betrayal of, betrayer of Jesus, but J Judas didn't get to become the betrayal of, Judah, of Jesus, things led up to him betray, betraying Jesus. He didn't just wake up one morning and says, you know what, I'm just going to betray Jesus today. You know what, I'm going to just turn him over to the priest and the high scribes. I'm just going to turn him over and, and that way I ain't got to worry about it no more. There were things that happened for that. Judas, keep in mind, was one of Jesus' in, in his circle. He was one of the twelve disciples. So he played a very crucial part. His fellow disciples never expected him to be a traitor. They never expected him. When Jesus was saying that one of you are going to betray me, none of them said, well, it's Judas. Hey, Judas is the one going to betray Jesus. They didn't know that. So Judas must have been pretty loyal or a pretty important to the disciples uh, because they never suspected him to be the traitor. I thought that was interesting to me that, that Judas never was suspected to be the traitor when Jesus would talk about, there's one of y'all that's going to betray me. The disciples never said, oh, well, it's Judas. Judas, I'm, you, I can't believe you're going to betray Jesus. Why does that happen? They trusted Judas so deeply that they put him in charge of their money bags. Judas was Jesus' treasure of, of, of the twelve. He was in charge of the money bags. Let's look at Judas, uh, John chapter 12, 
verses 1 through 6 and find out a little bit more how Judas became being, being a, a, uh, a man that's trusted with a money bag. How did Judas' sin get him to be the traitor, the, the, the one to betray Jesus and the traitor amongst the disciples? In John chapter 12, verses 1 through 6, Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, when Jesus had raised him, where, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at the table. Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with a fragrance of the perfume. But Judas, one of the disciples who was about to portray him, said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarios and give to the poor? He said this, not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. Listen to this right here. Having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. So Judas being a, a, a man that was over the, this, uh, the money bag, when he needed something, he would just take the money out of the bag. Thank you, Austin. Take the money out of the bag, and he would just help himself to it. Now I thought that was awful odd that he would just help himself out to it, and none of the other disciples really understood that. We don't see a man who suddenly decided to turn on Jesus. We watch him take small steps away from God until betraying Jesus was an easy decision. He used the degree of money, and what became easy of me just taking a little bit here and there, it made it easy when the time come for him to betray Jesus. The question that I ask myself, in what ways do secret sins deceive us and change us? That was a question that I asked myself when I was reading that because nobody else ever suspected that Judas was taking money out of the money bag whenever he seen fit. And then all of a sudden, because of his sin, which was secret of him taking the money out of the money bag, as it began to grow and undealt with and asking for forgiveness of that unrepented sin that he was fighting in his life, it became easy for him to portray Jesus. Judas made a premeditated decision to portray Jesus. The Gospel of Matthew tells us that Judas accepted 30 pieces of silver for turning Jesus over. That's worth about $600 in today's money. Listen to this statement right here. At some point, following Jesus became a low priority in Judas' life. Because he, the sin that he dealt with, with greed and, and being a, 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 a money-hungry it, following Jesus became a very low priority. A very low priority. So it began to get easy for Judas to betray Jesus. Another question that I asked myself when I was studying this, in what ways do you think sin changes our desires? Because Judas just didn't just wake up one day to decide to portray Jesus. There were small steps that took place of him just taking a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit here, a little bit there, that all of a sudden portraying Jesus became easy. It was so easy that 30 pieces of silver didn't last long. And this is a man that, that called him Lord and Teacher. Judas called Jesus Lord and Teacher. He was one that was in Jesus' inner circle. He was one of 
the twelve that followed Jesus, that walked with Jesus, that seen the things that Jesus did, the sin changed his desire. In our lives, the sin that you and I battle on a daily basis, if it's undealt with, and if it's not asked or repented for, it's very easy for us to become a Judas in our life. Jesus becomes a very low priority in our lives. And we become a Judas, a Judas because Jesus becomes a very low priority. So it's very, very important for you to deal with the sin that we have in our lives and not allow those sin to change our desires. Because we should all have a desire to want to please God. And when we have undealt with sin and unrepented sin, it changes our desires. Jesus sin, uh, Judas's sin escalated from taking a coin or two from friends to publicly betraying his Lord for a small amount of money. Small amount of money. So it's very easy for us to lose focus. It don't take but just a little bit. And dwelling in sin a little here and a little there will one day grow into something very easy, big that betray, uh, following Jesus will become a very low priority in your life. The next disciple that we see Jesus mention, man, I love the teachings of Jesus. Man, he, when he teaches uh, in this book of John, it just, I don't know what it is. I guess through our Sunday school lesson has really opened my eyes uh, to what is Jesus is really trying to say and really trying to do for us in our lives. Peter is the second disciple that is mentioned in the Gospel of John in chapter 13. And Peter is very, very well known for his confidence, his very vocal. He, he's very, very... He was one that is willing to, I'll die for you, Jesus. That ain't going to happen on my watch. He was very, very overconfident in that. And I think it's odd that that Jesus taught about a disciple that so easily betrayed him. And then he talks about a disciple that is very overconfident. And I began to, as I studied this and looking at this, I thought, man, how do these two go with each other? How does one, so, one betraying him so easy that his sin became a very high priority, a low priority of following Jesus, and then another one became so overconfident that he fell. And I found some things out as I was studying this that caused Peter to fall. We're known, Peter, for being very, very strong and very uh, overconfident and, and very powerful. But one of the things we don't know is, that we don't find out till later, is Judas, G, uh, Peter denied Jesus. In John chapter 13, verses 36 and 38, let's look right here. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, Where I am going, you cannot follow me, but you will follow afterward. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. I will lay down my life for you. Peter is one of the most loyal and the most vocal disciples. But in later scripture we see that he publicly denied Jesus three times in one night. Now here's a man that that would literally lay down his life for Jesus. But when, when things got tough, and when things got, was not going the way that he thought they would, he publicly denied 
Jesus. Peter had good intentions, but good intentions ain't enough. In John chapter 18, mere hours after professing that he would die for Jesus, he denied any association with Jesus three separate times, and then the rooster crows. Circumstances change, and what is easy to profess in comfort becomes difficult to claim in times of trouble. Hey, listen, it is very, very, very easy for me to stand before a crowd of people and proclaim how good God is in my life when the circumstances are easy. When the circumstance is easy, it's very easy for me to stand and hold my hand up and, and cry out to God and, and, and me proclaim God in my life. But it's very, very hard for you and I and myself to be able to, when things are tough, to proclaim God. Proclaim Jesus is the Lord of our life. It's very easy for me to sit in my home at night and, and, and ask God to bless my food that I'm about to eat. It's very easy for me to, to stand in my home at night and pray and thank God for all the blessings He has bestowed upon me. But it's even harder for us to do at times when we're at a restaurant to bow our hands and grab the hands of our family members and thank God for the blessing that we're about to take part in. It's very hard for me to see someone hurting in public and me go and pray with that person, with everybody standing around. It's hard to do that because I'm worried about what somebody may think about me, how somebody may feel about me, or what they're going to say about you. Hey, I was sitting here thinking, that's just what Peter did. He denied Christ three times. Refused to have any association with Jesus. Hey, it's very easy when things are good, when things are easy, to proclaim Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. But when things are hard, when you're in the public eye, because see, Peter was scared that his life might be taken from him too. So he, he decided, it, uh, this is too much, this is too much. Listen, following Jesus is absolutely the hardest thing that I have ever tried to do in my life. Just like it is your life. It, this is not for the faint of heart. This walk is not for the faint of heart. This, this walk is not for those that are looking for something to become easy in you. This walk is not looking... If you're going to profess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, listen, there's going to be some tough times in your life. And when those tough times come, that's when you need to be able to let Jesus be seen in your life. More than when things are easy. When things are, are easy. When you're in the own privacy of, of those... It's easy for me to praise the Lord among people that I'm, I'm around, that I love. You know, when G G Peter was among the twelve, Jesus, that won't happen on my watch. I'll die for you. And then Jesus finds himself being taken captive by the, the priest and getting ready to lose his life. And they, this girl says, well, hey, ain't you one of his twelve? Ain't you one of them? Uh-uh, I don't know who this man is. So easily denied him. So easily denied him. We are more prone to sin than we often care to admit. Man, whenever I think that I've got this walk figured out, when I think that I can tell Satan, bring it on. Bring it on, Satan. You can't do nothing to me. Bring it on. I'm strong in the Lord. I'm strong in the Lord. And then I realize just how weak I really truly am. And listen, if it can happen to Peter, a man that walked with Jesus day in and day out, a man that seen Jesus face to face, 
If it was easy for him to fall, do you think that it's not going to be even easier for you and I to fall? So don't ever let overconfidence in your faith in God think that you're better than who you really are. Temptation can sneak up on us and turn our confidence in denial. If there's one thing that we can be confident in, it is the faithfulness of God. Why do I say that statement? Because after the resurrection, Jesus returned to Peter and forgave him of his denial. And that was in John chapter 21, verses 15 through 19. Jesus returned after the resurrection and he forgave Peter for his denial. When Peter was faithless, God was even more faithful even to the day that he denied him. When Peter was faithless, God was even more faithful. And he does you and I the exact same way. When our faith fails us, God's faithfulness is there. When I'm overconfident, when I have undealt with sin that causes me to fail and betray Jesus, my God is more faithful to pick me up and says, Come on, son. Dust the dirt off of you. We still got work to do. There's still things that you can do. And we see later on where Peter is one of the best evangelistic men in the Bible in Acts chapter 2 when he goes to preaching. It wasn't very long that he was just a denial of Jesus. Didn't want to have no association with him. Hey, God is more than faithful to you and I. That in our times of denial, when our times of betrayal, He is more than faithful to say, you know what, if you'll put your trust in me and you'll come after me, you'll repent of your sin, listen, I'll do great things through you. And He sees that through Peter. Also, in John chapter 13, in closing, I got three things that Jesus showed us of who he was and what he was. Jesus showed us in John chapter 13 in verse 1 just how much love he had for his disciples. It says that he loved his disciples even to the end. Uh, all the way, those that were his own, that were in the world, he loved them to the end. Jesus was also nothing more than a true servant. He assumed the role as servant and washed his disciples' feet. In John chapter 13, verses 2 through 8, he, said, he lets them know that, listen, this I do, you do also. He assumed a role. I don't know about you, brothers and sisters, but when I think about Jesus being the Lord, being God in the flesh, being God in the flesh, gathering a group of men together, pulling His outer garment off, wrapping a towel around His waist, and getting on His hands and knees and washing what was portrayed to be, because listen, in that time, they didn't have socks and shoes on, brothers. They had sandals. And they walked on dirt roads. Your feet were nasty. Your, their feet were extremely nasty. And here is God Almighty Himself getting down on His feet and washing the disciples' feet. You want to say that he wasn't a simple servant, 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 a simple servant? Jesus was the greatest example of that. Jesus was also humble. 
Because he says, I want to, I want to read your scripture because I don't want to mess it up. Verse 16. Truly, truly, I say to you, in humility, Jesus says this, A servant is not greater than his master, nor is a, mas- a messenger greater than the one who sent him. In humility, Jesus knew his place. Jesus knew his place. So I think we can take a lesson from John chapter 13 to where you and I can not become a a Judas and become a Peter and become more like Christ just by loving on each other, by being nothing more than a simple servant to those that are around us and realizing that, hey, I'm not greater than you are. I hold no higher position than you are. All I am, all you are, is a messenger from God. And if you can take those three things and and you can show love to one another and you can be a servant to those that are around you and you can do it with humility, man, what God can do with you. What God can do with you.